going with too sentimental. Uh, in the next quarter of an hour or so, I'm going to try and explain what I did for the last four years, what my PhD thesis was all about. You see behind me on the screen, it says characterization of fatigue crack growth and adhesive bonds. And of course, the first question in any PhD thesis when you read the title is, what the heck do those words even mean? So let me first take you through the words, and then hopefully you have some idea, and then I'll explain what I actually did. So this, indeed, is a typical aircraft structure. In this case, it's from a helicopter, but you can see it in all types of aircraft, really, this type of structure. And what you see is that all the parts are joined together with rivets. All right, you see, there's a line of rivets here, there's a couple of lines next to each other here, and so on. Lots and lots of rivets. Now, if we put a rivet in a structure, to be able to do that, we need to make a hole. Right? And then also the loads that are transferred from the different parts, from the one to the other, all are concentrated into those rivets. Both of these things weaken the structure. So it means you have to reinforce the structure by adding extra material somewhere else. But the extra material means you're adding extra weight. If a plane has more weight, it will use more fuel. If it uses more fuel, it becomes more expensive to fly, and it's worse for the environment. I don't know about you, but when I like to go flying, I like it to be as cheap as possible and also to harm the environment as little as possible. So if instead of using rivets, you use a different way of joining uh, the parts together, maybe you can do something about that. For example, we can use adhesive bonding, which is a fancy way of saying gluing, to join the parts together. Then we don't need holes, we don't get this concentration of the loads, and we can get a much lighter structure because we don't need the reinforcements. Therefore, the plane is lighter, the flying is cheaper, less bad for the environment. So that is adhesive bonding. We want to glue things because that makes things better. Then the next one, fatigue crack growth. What does that mean? Well, if in a structure you have repeated loads, so you're pulling, let and go, pulling, let and go, lots and lots of times, then cracks can appear in the structure and over time they will grow. Each time you have one of these cycles of pulling and then letting go, the crack will grow a little bit further. And in order to be able to predict how long we can safely use the structure, how long it will last, we need to be able to predict how far the crack will grow, how fast it will grow. Right? Because a small crack is not a problem, but if the crack grows too large, then your parts start to separate, uh, and eventually they might fall off, which is a bad thing, because it wasn't obvious. <laughs> so we really want to know, if I apply a certain load cycle, how far will my crack grow? Which is some examples here. This is a plate which is bonded used to this plate, and you see there's a crack running all the way here. Uh, and here there's two aluminium plates which are glued together here, and there's a huge crack running up to that there. So that is fatigue crack growth. We want to be able to predict that. Okay. So I said predict a couple of times, but the title there says characterization. Why? Well, the thing is, there are lots of prediction models already. If you look in the literature, there's a whole bunch of them. But there's some issues with that. And to explain that, I'm going to take a small detour, give a little example. And I'm going to ask you for a second to forget everything you've remembered from high school physics, insofar as you have remembered things from high school physics. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you, what will happen if I let go of this laser pointer? What will happen is that the beetle will get very cross with me. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know the beetle, Laura is XREF, so I don't want you to get cross with me. Uh, but if I drop a pen, Right, the force will hit the floor. The question is, if I drop that pen from different heights, will it take a different amount of time to hit the floor? Obviously, yes. Can we predict that beforehand? Well, if we try and tackle that problem the same way people have tried to tackle problems of fatigue crack growth, then what we start with doing is take a pen and drop it from different heights. Like this. You get some data, okay, looks nice. And then the next step in fatigue crack growth is uh, we apply a law, known as Mars law, and Mars law says everything is linear if you plot a log log with a fat magic marker. <laughs> so we convert our axes to a log log scale and then you see, ah, oh, looks pretty nice. And then we pull out the magic marker, get a nice straight line, right? Uh, those of you who knew mathematics was a long time ago, you have to trust me on this, but this equation exp expresses this line, right? So the time it takes to hit the ground, is 0.404 times the height to the power of 0.5463. Okay, great, we have a prediction. Are we done? Well, here, the highest height I did was about 2 meters, because that's what we'll have. But what if I drop from 10 meters? 
100 meters, but about 10 kilometers, right? Does this equation still work? What if I have a longer pen, or a heavier pen, or a pen that's a different color? This equation tells me nothing about that. And it doesn't help me understand what's actually going on. Yes, for the pen I tested, I can predict, and I can maybe predict quite accurately, but I don't really understand the problem. So that's why we said, okay, we need to have a different approach, because what we can do for a pen is you can remember again what we learned in uh, high school physics. Right? There were some physical laws. We have the laws of motion. Right? Maybe it's high school physics, maybe it's first year dynamics. Anyway, we know that from the laws of motion, the distance an object covers, if it starts from rest, is one half times acceleration times the time squared. You can do some algebra on that, and eventually get that the time it will take for an object to cover a certain distance, for example, did before, is the square root of two over the gravitational acceleration times the time to the power a half. Now, if you compare that to that empirical equation I found, things start to make sense. Right? We have a 0.404 here, and this works out to 0.45, so that's quite close, considering how inaccurate my test setup was. Uh, here we have a half, and here we have a 0.546p. So now we can start to understand things. You can say, okay, this number we get here in the red circle, that has something to do with gravity, with the local acceleration due to gravity, right, and nothing else. So now we know what influences our results. <coughs> This uh, 0.54 here is from that 0.5, and that 0.5 comes from that square, and ultimately, they okay, trust me on this, it comes because you have to integrate acceleration twice to get the position, right? And then we can explain why we get this equation, and we can understand what we can change in the real world and how that will or won't affect that equation. So the goal of this research was to kind of do the same thing for fatigue crack growth. Right? Forget about predicting for a second, we can do predictions, as long as we stay close enough to our test conditions. Just take a step back and really try to understand what's going on. And the first step is to be able to characterize, to be able to describe what is going on in the material, in terms of the physics. Right? So that was the characterization. So that is all my words in my title. So what did I actually do? Well, we started off eventually with Start off the wrong word. Eventually, uh, I came up with this model to kind of make sense of what's going on in the material. And it says, that's not my idea, it's from the 20, from Mr. Griffith. He said, well, if there is a crack which is going to grow, that requires energy. We have to form new surfaces, we have to break bonds, we have to put energy into the system to be able to do that. So the amount of energy that's required, and you can think of that as a resistance to crack growth, right? If you need more energy, it's harder for the crack to grow. At the same time, there is energy which is available, somehow, because we are loading the system, and somehow that makes energy available to the crack, and that allows the crack to grow. So if we know how much energy is available, and how much energy is required, then from that combination we can find how far the crack will grow in a certain cycle. Right, that's the idea, I'll show you a bit more about it in the end. Uh, and crucially, both the available energy and the required energy are determined by the load we apply. Not just how much energy is available, that makes sense, but also the resistance. I'll show you some evidence for that in a second. So how did I test this model? Well, I uh, used this test setup, it's called a double cantilever beam, because we have two beams, in my case made of aluminium 2024 T3, uh, joined with an FM94 epoxy adhesive. So the adhesive is along this line, and we pulled it apart in fatigue with this, these clamps. Uh, and as the test goes on, this crack goes further and further into the material. Then you can measure the force and displacement during the test. And you get the graph you see on the left here. That's the force displacement. And then the surface area under that graph is the strain energy in the system. It's how much work we're doing on the specimen each time we're putting. Now, if you do the test uh, for the experts in the room under displacement control, uh, then the amount of energy in the system will reduce. As a crack gets longer, it becomes less stiff, those arms, because they're longer, and therefore the amount of energy that is in the system, if you keep on going to the same displacement, reduces. You can plot that during the test, you see the graph here, and then you can take the derivative of that graph, and then you get du dn. 
which is the energy dissipation per cycle. So for each cycle I test, I can measure how much energy was dissipated during that cycle. And then I can plot that against my crack growth rate, and I get some very nice graphs. Again, on low block scale, of course, so if you remember Mars law, but okay, uh, so far I got. So we have the energy dissipation, the crack growth rate, you see they line up very nicely. Also, if I have different ratios between the minimum and the maximum stress, that's what R means, uh, almost coincides, not entirely, we'll get back to that in a second, but we get these nice correlations. So indeed, there is a very strong relationship between the energy dissipation and the crack growth. Another interesting thing you can see about these graphs is that the slope is not equal to 1. That's a bit surprising because you would expect that the amount of energy you need is always the same, and then the slope should be 1. So if the slope is not equal to 1, the amount of energy you need per unit of crack growth is apparently not the same during your test. It's changing. <coughs> To examine that a bit further, I did a little trick. I said, well, let's look at one value of the crack growth rate, BADN. In this case, 10 to the minus 4. So we draw a line. And I said, well, all these uh, tests, I just look at the one point where the crack growth rate was 10 to the minus 4 millimeters per cycle. And then we see that to create that 10 to the minus 4 millimeters, in each test, we needed a different amount of energy. Right? In this test, we were down here. In this test, we were almost two and a half times as high. This is an outlier. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I've ignored it. Not the best practice, perhaps, but okay, you have to start somewhere. Uh, what you furthermore see is that, okay, the question is, well, so why do you need this huge difference <coughs> amount of energy if we create the same amount of track growth? And what I found is if you plot that against the maximum load you're applying in terms of strain energy risk rate, for that words, then that appears to correlate very strongly to how much energy we need to the resistance, right? The higher the maximum load, the higher the resistance to crack growth, the more energy I need to create the same amount of crack growth. Okay, so then the next question. All these cases, we have different amounts of resistance, right? We have different amounts of energy we needed. But we got the same amount of crack growth. So what's going on there? What is driving that then? Well, I kind of did the same trick. Except now instead of keeping the crack growth rate constant, I looked for all the different tests for the same resistance value. Right? So for the same value of energy per amount of crack growth. And here you see an example for 0 0.7 millijoules per square millimeter. So in all of these tests, I looked for the point where did it take 0 0.7 millijoules to get one square millimeter of crack growth. And again, you find that the amount of energy dissipated in that cycle varies hugely. Well, it correlates very strongly to the cyclic work. So how much work we are doing each time we are pulling the specimen over. Right? But that also correlates strongly to the range of the load, so the difference between minimum and maximum. <coughs> Unfortunately, I didn't figure out how that works. This is about as far as I got. Right? But at least we see that so the load range seems to characterize how much energy we have available, and the maximum load characterizes how much energy we need. So it's all a bit quick. So what should you remember from my uh, thesis? We go on three things. First of all, I found a new method of characterizing fatigue crack growth by measuring the energy dissipation and using that as a new way of looking at the problem. Number two, I found that how much energy we need to generate a certain amount of crack growth seems to depend on the maximum load we're applying and how much energy we have available seems to depend on the range of load you're applying or on the cyclic work you're applying. Those, I think, are the three key points of my thesis. I need some more stuff. There'll be some questions on that, no doubt. But these are the, the main message. So for those of you who uh, don't visit uh, defenses very often, this is roughly the program. Uh, at exactly 3 o'clock, the committee will go in, preceded by the Beadle, consisting of one chairman and seven other members. The seven other members will ask me questions about my work, maybe the chairman, but usually not. Uh, after exactly one hour, the leader will come in, the banger may say who I asked, and then it's over. Uh, the committee will go out, they will deliberate a bit and decide uh, whether I was good enough or not, whether they want to give me the diploma or not, and have some coffee maybe, maybe you never know. 
And then they'll come back, so that's probably around 20 past four-ish, which is every time short. Uh, there's another brief ceremony, in which hopefully they give me a diploma. Uh, and then at uh, 4.30, they will go, they will go out uh, to, I think, the philosophy which is behind here, and there will be a reception where you will more than welcome. Thank you, once again, all of you, for being here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.